Good afternoon. My name is Claire York and I'm a PhD student in the War Studies Department at King's College in London and I'm also a 2015 Aspen Security Forum Scholar. I'm delighted to introduce our next session on Iran and the bomb. This month we witnessed the agreement of a deal between the P5 plus one and Iran on Iran's nuclear capabilities. However, numerous questions remain. For the United States, is this a historic rapprochement that sets the tone for new engagement with Iran? And will it constrain their nuclear ambitions? Or is it an appeasement of a regime that will do little to change? And what does it mean for the region more broadly? This panel will address the threat of a nuclear Iran uh, among the game-changing other threats that are currently present. It will assess how best to counter them and whether this deal will really constrain their ambitions. Moderating this session is Michael Crawley. Michael is Politico's senior foreign affairs correspondent covering foreign policy and national security from Washington. Prior to joining Politico in October 2014, Michael was chief foreign affairs correspondent for Time magazine. He has reported from more than a dozen countries, including Iraq, China, Israel, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Lebanon, and Ukraine, where things are often quite busy from time to time. And with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm glad to see a good turnout. Anyone who decided to skip out early and uh, call it a day is making a big mistake. This is um, going to be a great panel. And needless to say, this is a topic um, on everyone's minds. Uh, and we're going to try to go a little bit beyond uh, some of the things you've been hearing ad nauseum for the past 10 days and really try to look forward uh, at what the Iran deal means uh, for the US, Iran, and the region. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of the deal. And if people want to ask about that in questions, that's fine. But for a lot of this panel, I think we won't spend too much time on centrifuge counts uh, in 24 days. Let me quickly uh, introduce the panelists, and then we'll get down to it. Uh, Starting uh, on my left is uh, John McLaughlin, former deputy director and acting director of the CIA, now distinguished practitioner in residence at the Philip Merrill Center for International Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, next to him is Matthew Spence, who recently departed the Pentagon, where he was deputy assistant secretary for Middle East policy. He's also a former special assistant to the president <laughs> and an advisor to two national security advisors. Uh, and Ellen Lapson is president and CEO of the Stimson Center. She spent 25 years in government, including as vice chair of the National Intelligence Council. John, let me start with you. Back in Washington this morning, Secretary uh, Kerry got quite a grilling from, uh, uh, from a Senate committee uh, in which, among other things, he was told that he had been fleeced, bamboozled, and was likened to a hotel guest who left the hotel with nothing but the uh, hotel robe on his back. Uh, <laughs> Do you agree? What, what, give us your take on the deal. I would say, leaving aside all of the uh, details about centrifuges and percentages of uh, enriched material, we can come back to that. I would say this deal is a, it's not as bad a deal as the critics think, and it's not as good a deal as we would like. I think on the whole, it's better to have this deal than to not have a deal. And I can see it unfolding in about three different scenarios. I mean, anyone who tells you they know exactly where this is going to go in today's Middle East is delusional. Uh, we can come back to the scenarios later, but I, I'd leave it at that. I think it's better to have this deal than to not have it. Great. Alan, we'll move to you. We'll get the three of you sort of on the record, and then we can uh, build out from that. But give me your initial take on the deal, and then I'm going to follow up with something that you wrote about what the deal could become. But just as in you know, measuring the agreement for what it is, what's your reaction? I think it's a remarkable diplomatic achievement. I think its success will depend on how robustly it's implemented. I think the Iranians still have some hard choices to make of whether they're going to comply as fully as the agreement obliges them to do. But I look at th through the prism of does it change the dynamics for regional security? And I think once we get past this period of, of theatrics and drama, and I think people having very emotional reactions to whether they trust the Iranians or not, I think people will accept that this is very much a net positive for the region. So let me follow up uh, from the get-go, because you had a pretty ambitious uh, 
uh, take on what it could become mm -hmm. in something you wrote in April. You said that this deal is a great moment of opportunity for the Arab world, with Israel as a silent partner, to strike a new bargain with Iran. Can you explain what you mean by that? And can we really expect closer Arab-Iranian cooperation at a moment like this where there's so much sectarian conflict and distrust in the region? Well, let's be, let's be clear. The agreement, in a way, is a narrow technical agreement on only some of Iran's behavior that we have found problematic. But for the United States, it was about the behavior that we thought was most directly harmful, potentially, to American interests, that we would have security obligations and uh, a need to respond if Iran went further along the path of becoming a nuclear weapons capable state. The countries in the region were telling us that it was an existential threat to them for Iran to become a nuclear weapons capable country. We then ginned up a very robust and high risk strategy with our uh, UN partners and got to the finish line on a, a plan that does limit Iran's and, and eventually in, virtually prevents Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons state for at least a decade, a decade and a half. So it is still a little bit confusing to me, and as you say, these other, the other reasons why there's turmoil and violence and mistrust in the region are clearly creating an environment where nobody, people are only looking at the downsides of the agreement. They're not looking at the potential upsides. What I was trying to do in April is say, let's look out at the horizon when we get over the the initial period, um, how might this change regional relations? Um, I think Arabs should see a net security benefit to them to know that there is not another nuclear weapon state in the region. Um, but it will be a period of adjustment. It is not the first time that the United States has tried to help the countries in the region establish a better modus vivendi. Um, and I think we're already seeing the Saudis recalibrate a bit how they talk about the agreement and how they talk about their long-term relations with Iran. Matt, you were on the inside as this unfolded. I, I, the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, did you expect the deal to come through? The president was saying it was a less than 50-50 proposition. Um, were you surprised that it clicked into place? And, uh, and what should we be thinking about it? So Michael, first of all, thanks to you and the Aspen Institute for having me here. The one conclusion I am fairly certain of after spending less than a day here, had the negotiations been in Aspen instead of in <laughs> Switzerland, they would still be going on because no one dared would have wanted to leave. Um, it, it's a far better uh, place to talk through these hard issues. Um, for your question, you know, the way I think about it, I, I was pessimistic about whether a deal would happen uh, because I wasn't sure if the Iranians could get to the place they needed to be. You know, if you look at the tremendous amount of pressure that Iran was under, be it their tremendous economic degradation as a result of sanctions, manifested in the, re the election of President Rouhani, which showed the distrust and dissatisfaction with where the country was going. Iran was definitely under pressure. It was less clear whether internally Iran could reach a place that would meet America's red lines and sort of getting them. The way I would think about the deal right now is the adage that this is really, at the very most, the end of the beginning, if only that. This is one important step for a huge amount of things that need to happen next. And the two things that I'm most concerned about, both that I was in the government as well, is first, verification and inspections and what happens if there's cheating. And then second, recognizing that any arms control agreement is just dealing with that, arms control in one part. But the nuclear piece is just one part of broader issues of Iran's behavior in the region. And so the focus on us needs to be now is how do we deal with Iran's other bad behavior in the region? And how do we think about a strategy to move past the nuclear issue, which is a tremendous achievement that we can do, but dealing with the whole other range of things that Iran is trying to do in the region already doing? So I want to come back to that and talk about it in more detail. But let me ask you about events this week. Ash Carter, for whom you worked briefly, you were kind of winding down your tenure. I uh, just saw Bibi Netanyahu mm -hmm. in Israel, uh, and then he went to Riyadh to see uh, the, the Saudi king. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think those conversations were like? And at this point, what can Ash Carter be telling the Israelis and the Saudis that they haven't heard 50 times? You know, I mean, I, I, think, I think what I expect would have happened, uh, having been to Israel in particular, I think probably almost 30 times the last three years in my job working on Middle East policy, is is in a sense something similar to what they've heard before, but it's very important they keep hearing it because it has the advantage of being very, very true. 
that the United States knows that Iran is more than an arms control issue. And what I mean by that is Iran has regional hegemonic ambitions. They're conducting terrorist attacks. They have been reported in the press to have attempted and conducted cyber attacks. They have the largest conventional military in the region, and they have a huge amount of asymmetric threats. What all of this means is that the United States is not going anywhere just because a deal has signed. In fact, in some sense, even though I think the likelihood of war thankfully has decreased, and the likelihood of Iran getting a nuclear weapon is dramatically declined, the work is beginning and America's commitment is still there. So I think the message to both Israel and the Saudis are, the United States will continue to have an enormous commitment in the region. We have a significant amount of military resources in the region. We have 34,000 American forces stationed in the region. Over 10,000 forward deployed troops, some of the most advanced aircraft, missile defense warning systems, missiles and technology that that region and the world has ever known. That's not going anywhere. And because of that, there is a huge amount of concrete manifestation of America's commitment to resisting the range of Iran's behavior, which we cannot expect Iran will stop, but we are going to be there to show them the cost of acting and to deter them from doing some bad things. John, talk, if you would, about the role of the intelligence community here. Um, it seems to me there are two different kinds of intelligence that will be important, and maybe there are two different conversations, but let me just throw this out there. You know, one is the kind of close monitoring of Iranian facilities and suspected facilities, and the question of verification, will we catch them if they try to cheat? Um, the other is analysis about uh, internal Iranian domestic politics and what direction the regime is headed, what its intentions are, and to the extent that this may be as some people say, a bet on reform in Iran. Do we really have visibility into what direction the country is headed? Why don't you take on the first question, uh, the first part of that first, and talk to the extent that you can about uh, the role the intelligence community will have uh, in kind of backstopping this deal in a way that the administration can't talk about in a lot of public detail. Sure. Uh, before I do that, let me just uh, elaborate on one point Matt made. Uh, when I talk to some of my Israeli friends, I find that Israeli opinion is a little more variegated on this issue than one might think. I mean, as far as I can tell, most Israelis think this is not a good deal, but they don't all speak of it quite as harshly as Netanyahu does. Uh, they see, for example, that a short-term advantage. I mean, the, the basic fact is that Iran is now less nuclear. It will be after about a 90-day transition period if all works out. That's something everyone needs to remember. The deal doesn't really take effect for a while yet, a lot of steps in between, but it will be less nuclear capable than it was before. Remember, they were two or three months away from a bomb. If, if the first steps of this occur, they will be a year away from a bomb. So Israelis recognize that. Their concern is more about the longer term. And we, we can talk about that because at the end of 15 years, of course, uh, the game is up in terms of uh, these, these events. Now, on your question, I think what we'll see here is a kind of, um, and let me make clear, I'm not speaking for the intelligence community, so I'm not giving away something here that I shouldn't, but then I probably will. Um, <laughs> because it's hard not to sometimes. Please do. But, but uh, <laughs> well, I think what you'll see unfold here is a kind of synergy between um, the intelligence world and the world of inspection, which is not to say that the world of inspection, the IAEA and such, is dependent on intelligence entirely or that they're working for intelligence. But intelligence will be looking very carefully at Iranian behavior, and uh, we're pretty good at this, to detect um, suspicious activity or cheating. I would remind everyone that uh, in 2002, that's exactly what we detected in the case of North Korea, which had an agreement made with the United States in 1994 uh, to stop their nuclear activity, and we detected in 2002 that they were preparing to acquire the materials for a uranium enrichment path. They had been using plutonium. So I think intelligence will be very good at this. And um, I want to say a few words about the IAEA. They're pretty good. Uh, they're probably undermanned for this job at this time, but they have a record of being, and they're, they're going to be, by virtue of Iran at some point in the next three months, accepting what's called the additional protocol to the um, non-proliferation treaty, they will have authority to be much more intrusive in what they do in Iran than they have been up till now, which, by the way, is something that Israelis have noted to me that as an advantage of this, there will be more intrusive monitoring. 
And uh, if you look at uh, even the issue, now, of course, here's where the problem is going to come on that side. Um, the first time we detect some sort of suspicious activity somewhere, and Iran doesn't want us to look there, there's an elaborate procedure that can stretch out over 24 days uh, of negotiation with Iran about whether we could look there. And of course, everyone is assuming that in that period of time, they would sanitize that site. And when you got there, there'd be nothing there. But I want to say IAEA, the Atomic Energy Agency, has had pretty good record at that sort of thing. For example, uh, there are instances in both Iran and Syria where they've gone in after, in the case of Syria, after uh, Israel had bombed a uh, suspected nuclear facility there and managed still to detect that nuclear activity had been underway there, largely because what they do in a circumstance like that is just take minuscule swabs of um, various things that could be suspected to be nuclear associated. And they did this also in Iran when Iran was previously um, lying to us about uh, an electrical factory that was also nuclear related. So bottom line here is uh, if all works as it's supposed to work, the intelligence and inspection part of this, I think, will be pretty effective. But I also suspect that's the first place where it can break down mm. be because of Iranian objections to somewhere we want to go. And one of the most uh, worrisome aspects of the Iran uh, suspected program was at a place called Parchin, where it was thought that they were doing conventional explosive testing that would be a, sort of a a substitute for nuclear testing. And they've not allowed us to go there. And in the agreement, uh, it says very little other than that there will be a separate arrangement between the IAEA and Iran on Parchin. So there's a lot of negotiations still to occur here. And that here. separate agreement has become a point of contention in Congress, which yep. wants to know more about it. And that's been an issue this week. Ellen, you wanted to jump yeah, in on that. Uh, just on the, how intelligence coverage of the Iran uh, issues may shift a bit uh, in the good direction. Um, as you all know, what we think about is both capabilities and intentions. And at least on the softer human side of uh, covering Iran, there are now at least some relationships. We have now been able to establish some kind of human contact with at least some of the key players in Iran. We're not getting anywhere close to the supreme leader. We don't really know what happens in the inner sanctums in Iran. But at least there are now channels that will be I think uh, a, a breath of relief after so many decades where we were following Iran remotely and knew that we could follow large movements of, of, of military forces, but we really felt very handicapped at not knowing enough about the internal politics. We all know that this agreement was sort of negotiated by this, the good guys of Iran, if you want to believe that, of uh, President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, but there's a whole other part of the Iranian system that probably takes a very different view on the desirability of the agreement. So I'm not suggesting that just by all the time that Secretary Kerry has spent with Foreign Minister Zarif or that Energy Minister Moniz has spent with his Iranian counterpart that somehow that is sufficient. But it's a big improvement on what we've had for over 30 years. Yeah. And, and I think intelligence yeah. people are certainly aware of what others are aware of, those who visited Iran and spent a lot of time there who not necessarily intelligence people, and that is that you know, Iran, and there's nothing in this agreement that guarantees a transformation in Iran. But having said that, um, Iran has competing power centers. It has a quasi-democracy. 40% uh, of the uni university graduates are women. Um, it, it is still very repressive at the top, but we saw as recently as 2009 a reform movement that got squashed, but which hovers there beneath the surface. So there is, and I think the election of Rouhani that uh, Ellen refers to, I mean, he wasn't supposed to win. I mean, the Expedience Council determines who gets to run. And in the last go-round, they didn't even let a uh, fellow named Rafsanjani run, who was generally thought to be more pragmatic than others. He wasn't allowed to run. Rouhani was sort of the one person allowed to run who was thought to be um, a little off-center in terms of the, uh, the regime, and he won which tells you that there is some sort of yearning there, which visitors always report back, some sort of yearning for engagement with the outside world. Now, that being said, the mullahs at the top still call the shots. So uh, but my point is there are competing power centers there. And if this agreement goes well, what do I mean by goes well? 
If Rouhani gets what he was really bargaining for, sanctions relief, which can also be seen as a detriment, of course, because they have more money to do the bad things, but if he gets sanctions relief, then in the parliamentary election scheduled for February, I would expect his faction to have some traction and maybe gain some votes. What does that mean? Well, maybe the balance in their parliament begins to shift a little bit. These are all sort of gossamer concepts, but it's kind of what you're working with here. Matt, do you yeah. think that's uh, too optimistic? From the, from the Pentagon point of view, yeah. in my experience, people in the Pentagon are take a dimmer view of these theories of, <laughs> of reform than maybe some folks elsewhere in the administration, the State Department. So right. uh, you want to jump in. Go ahead. Sure. I mean, if I was doing my job right at the Pentagon, no one would ever accuse me of being an optimist. <laughs> uh, so that's always sort of a good way to, to, to lead things. Um, but I would say I agree with what Alan and, and John have said that I think we need to understand the potential impact of having so many contacts between the United States and Iranians. You know, to put it in context, at the beginning of this administration, the United States communicated with Iranians through the SWIFT's protective power, through the UN, and through occasional very high-level letters. That was very, very something unique. Now you have senior US diplomats talking on their cell phones, talking, spending weeks at a time having intense negotiations. Now, those types of things aren't going to change interest in international politics, but the fact that a country that we don't have an embassy in, that we now are going to have 24-hour surveillance from the IAEA, and we talk so much to their diplomats, that provides channels to test issues and see if there are things that we can talk through. And I think we shouldn't uh, underestimate the possibility it happens that we're talking to them at all. And I think with the Iranians, more openness and more contact with the United States is only in our interest, even if we recognize that we're not talking to the full spectrum of Iranians in the political system. Ellen, and is, and is that enough? I mean, you wrote some interesting, uh, you had some interesting thoughts that I read about our history of misjudging Iran. So mm -hmm. we didn't really see the Islamic Revolution coming. We've uh, continually overestimated the influence and the promise of the moderates and, and been burned by it uh, several times in the past decades. Um, so. Is this time different? Do you think that these oh, talks yeah. really give us reason to think that it's different? Or is there more we need to be doing? Or do we need to recognize our limitations? What, how do you think about it right now? So we'll make new mistakes instead of the old mistakes. Yeah. But no, actually, it's very interesting that when the revolution came and there was an after action, so we're now talking late 70s, early 80s, there was a, a very painful acknowledgement that we let the Shah tell us that we couldn't talk to the opposition in Iran, okay? Very hard in a country that had, went from authoritarianism to this very messy and ultimately very unattractive revolution. But there was a period in transition where the United States was the most important outside actor in Iran. We had huge uh, business presence there, um, military presence. We were involved in every aspect of Iran, Iranian life. And you know, Iran was our great partner and friend in the region, along with Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, so think how much has changed. But the, the recognition that even with a large embassy, we had filtered or censored ourselves a bit because of that special relationship and didn't deeply understand the society. This is, I think, an ongoing challenge for uh, analysts in democratic countries around the world of, you know, not just ours, but I think our European partners probably face some of the same dilemmas, that you're always balancing how much you want to um, kind of get along with the incumbent regime and how you want to be making sure you're scanning the horizon for what might change and who are the other actors and who are some of the rising voices in this country. So we sometimes censor ourselves, sometimes we simply have no access. Um, I'm not suggesting that we're suddenly switching, that the switch has moved 180 degrees. This will be a very gradual, incremental process to kind of widen the lens. But in this period, during these negotiations, the State Department and other parts of our um, sort of public-private world have been able to open the aperture a bit for civil society exchanges. I don't know if you're aware, but there are some amazing things going on at the non-government level between the United States and Iran. You know, Berkeley and Shiraz University have an exchange. I mean, there's, but all non-governmental. So there's exchanges on public health. There are exchanges on environmental issues. There are some joint projects on teaching the Iranians about urban resilience because they're earthquake prone and they have some of the same 
you know, natural disaster issues that we have. Um, so there's, we are trying, I think, and it, which is why I think we want to go back to, even though the president was very scrupulous in saying this deal was only about the nuclear activities, we made no promises, and it was not contingent on a more comprehensive approach. The Iranians themselves may have wanted that more comprehensive approach, but we took a very technocratic approach to these negotiations. In reality, I think there is a bigger box in which this is happening. Yeah. And that bigger box is beginning a process of trying to engage uh, more openly with Iranians for the long term, whether the revolution survives or whether eventually it is replaced by a more open regime. And by the way, anecdotally, this is probably a very small part of it, but uh, you know, I was seeing journalists, uh, American, European, yeah. and Iranian journalists kind of getting to know each other on Twitter and sharing notes and starting relationships. So maybe there's a little bit of Twitter diplomacy it, happening. I don't think that's going to But let's acknowledge that the journalists change. who go to Iran are at high risk. And yeah. poor Jason and his trial right now. So. Matt, but having said all that, um, you know, I think about the fact that you know, most, if not all, of Iran's neighbors uh, who are in real proximity to them, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, think this is crazy talk and it's naive. And have, despite that, I was surprised to see Ash Carter say after leaving Riyadh that King Salman had expressed his support for the nuclear deal. Um, and you know, this comes after a year and a half or more of the Saudis kind of railing against yeah. it and saying it's crazy. Um, so first of all, were you surprised to hear that reaction? And then, and then I want to talk about some more specifically some things we're doing to reassure the Saudis. But what was yeah. your reaction to that? You know, it's interesting. In, in my experience, and I spent a lot of time talking with the Saudis, Emiratis, other GCC partners about it, they, they were never so hard up against a deal that they, that they sort of threw down a red line and said we couldn't do this. The, the concern was much more in, in the sense of, look, if there's a deal, we know how America's uh, defense resources are stressed. We've heard about the pivot, uh, the pivot to, Ava, to Asia with everything, with sequestration, with Congress is doing. Are you really going to be here if the deal is done? I think, I think they're very savvy to realize, like, the deal has happened right now. The question is, what, what is next? And, right. and to your point, the what is next is, in a sense, <laughs> is the most important thing yeah. happening right now. Now, everyone talks about President Obama in May gather the leaders of the GCC states in Camp David to talk about what that means. But there is an effort that goes well past a year before, or 18 months and two years before, which I remember working a lot on, which is about what can we do to build up the capabilities of the GCC, and what can we do to assure them they can deal with the threats? Yeah. And the threats that these efforts worked on were cybersecurity, maritime security and the closure of the Strait of Hormuz, and air and missile defense. And all three are those things that Iranian poses a threat. And so we need to intensify our efforts and hopefully use the deal as an opportunity to get the GCC countries to work more closely together because all of those threats are collective action issues. No one country can deal with them at the one time. So I think we could try to find an opportunity out of what's happened here to try to bring about some of the cooperation that's been incredibly hard to do since the founding of the GCC uh, you know, a long time ago. Uh, Ellen, did you want to chime in yeah. quickly? I want to give John his turn. But okay. On security cooperation, I do think the U.S. has made a lot of progress with the GCC and the President's invitation to come to Camp David, I think, made a difference. But let's remember that within the GCC, you have very different approaches to Iran. The United Arab Emirates is a major trading partner. There's a Persian community that lives there. So you have a, a spectrum of views on the sectarian Sunni Shia problem and on dealing with Iran in general. So they, if, if you give it at the high level of security and deterrence, they agree. But when it comes to economic interaction with Iran, they actually have very different policies. Mm -hmm. John, were you going to uh, no, go ahead. jump in? Yeah. Well, well, then let me ask you about how we strike the balance, because it seems to me that's going to be a real challenge here. That you know, what Matt is suggesting is that as a result of this deal, to some degree, we have to flex more muscle in the region. And we have to uh, not only reassure allies like the Saudis, mm -hmm. but also demonstrate to the Iranians that they just can't have the run of the place. Um, <laughs> but how do you find the balance between doing that without stumbling into a confrontation that blows up the nuclear deal, blows up whatever fledgling relationship we might have. Do you think we can walk that line? Well, it's going to be hard. Um, you, you know, I, I think we have to, one way to get at that question is to say, remember this deal and the, these negotiations have been going on since about 2007 in one form or another. The, the Middle East that we're seeing today is so dramatically different than the Middle East 
we had in 2007. Um, we have a Middle East now that is in conflict on at least four or five dimensions. Uh, Persian Arab, Sunni Shia, uh, reformer versus traditionalist, terrorist versus regime, and I could probably add a fifth, terrorist versus terrorist. Never seen that before. So uh, the kind of task that you're sketching out for the United States here is extraordinarily difficult. Um, you could say that the Middle East right now is experiencing something like um, the, uh, oh, I, I don't know, the 40 Years' War in Europe uh, back in the uh, 17th century, which was about religious, religion, commerce, uh, territory, and ultimately it was sorted out after all those years, 30 years. And um, it may be that's what we're seeing in the Middle East now. So for the United States, almost anything we do is going to be provoke uh, an opposite reaction somewhere. So I think we're going to have to handle this very carefully. And in the inspection process, um, look, there are going to be disputes. I mean, we're talking about this as though it's a done deal. The delicacy here is going to appear sometime in the next 90 days. For example, most people, I don't think, realize that Iran still has to work out with the IAEA a kind of roadmap for how the IAEA will behave and what it will have access to and how, how inspections will actually work. That's going to be contentious. And then, inevitably, um, we're going to want to look at something that they don't want us to look at. And at that point, I think we reach the crunch point because um, Iran's view, which they've expressed, is if we back away from this agreement, then all bets are off with them. And they start enriching again. And uh, they quickly become, I think, a nuclear threshold state again. So we're going to have to cal calibrate all of this pretty carefully. And what if things really go off the rails? Uh, and there's talk about a military option. Yeah. You, you warned in 2012 that a US strike on Iran would be, quote, a very bad option. Do you yeah, still feel I, that I, way? And I just want to throw in one addendum yeah. to the question. Since then, the military has the big bunker refined the, big, the massive yeah. ordnance penetrator, this 15-ton this, uh, right. weapon that can uh, probably, possibly, there's some debate, get hit Fordo and other underground sites. Does that change the way you feel about it at all? Could we do it surgically? I, or do you still I, think that it would be a big mistake? I don't think so. Yes, you can do it surgically. If by surgically you mean you don't have to follow up with uh, 20,000 troops. Although, here's, here's my first caution about that. When you look at the history of warfare, one thing stands out above everything else. When you inflict violence, you don't know where it's going. You don't. You may think you do, but you don't. So that's the first thing. If we do that, we'd better prepare very carefully for option B, option C, and option D so that we know, have some idea of where this could go, what are the scenarios that come out of it. Second, a military strike would do functionally exactly what this agreement is doing. I mean, it wouldn't destroy, it wouldn't for all time destroy the nuclear capability, it would delay it. And this agreement, by the way, what this agreement does is, this agreement doesn't do anything but buy us time. That's all it does. Uh, if, if you believe that 10 to 15 years from now, assuming the Iranians follow the rules and, and play the agreement out, that, that they would then have the capacity, as the president has acknowledged, to become a nuclear state. So we've bought that time. And given the kind of turmoil I just sketched out in the Middle East, that's not a bad thing, because we don't know where the Middle East is going to settle out. You talk about the Saudis, and for example, I'm not sure why King Salman is saying what he's saying, but they're in a kind of funny situation now, because our very close relationship with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the closer relationship with Israel postdates the, um, the fall of the Shah. I mean, as Ellen pointed out, prior to that, Iran was our big partner in the region. Now the Saudis and Egyptians in particular must be looking at this whole arrangement and saying, is there a tectonic shift occurring here potentially in which our role, our relationship to the United States, our overall position in the Middle East is less than it is? Because as we look ahead here, if you were going to cite the certainties, 
I would say one certainty out of this is Iran is going to become more powerful, for better or for worse, going to become more powerful in the region, either with this agreement or without it, but particularly with it. And Matt, what is that going to mean? Be specific, because I know you spend a lot of time, you and your colleagues, looking at these scenarios. But what are a couple of the friction points that we're going to have to be really careful of? And I'm thinking of the Strait of Hormuz, for instance, yeah. where we've already had a little bit of um, tension in yeah. the last few months. Uh, yeah. Is that going to is that going to escalate? I mean, I mean, I think I, I I agree with what John said. I mean, I think as we look at Iran, Iran has a uh, will have an increasing population, increasing youth population. Sort of even if you hold aside the nuclear issue, this is not a disarmament agreement. I mean, this is Iran is still growing in the, in the region. And the thing that you talked about is, I think that the major concerns are what they can do uh, with maritime security in the Strait of Hormuz, what they can do with cyber issues, and other asymmetric issues. You know, I mean, I remember being on an aircraft carrier, going through the Strait of Hormuz, and seeing these small Iranian fast boats, which are effectively boats which look like they could either have contraband or a water skier behind them, or potentially something that would be very deadly to ships going through. Those are the types of things that Iran still will have that we need to be very wary about what they're doing. Now, it's not an Iran's issue to shut down the straits right now because if oil doesn't flow, it's as bad for them, particularly now as they're getting back on markets as much for us. But still, the fact that they can have that threat and that uncertainty, and we're still not clear about the decision making, who too controls what within Iran, those are the issues I think we really need to be but, aware of. Let me give you um, an assessment from an Israeli former intelligence officer, and this is what I agree with. And it also will uh, perhaps puncture the impression I've given that, I'm a, that I may have given that I'm a starry-eyed optimist about all of this. I mean, I do see potential for good things coming from it, but uh, this uh, former intelligence officer, very senior, sees it this way. Three scenarios, and I'm going to mention them in terms of the least likely first and the most likely last. First scenario, transformation. In other words, the, what, what I think the administration is hoping and to a degree betting on is what all of us have talked about as a possibility that is, that Iran, through all of these contacts, through um, the changing nature of that society, and 60% of the people in that society have grown up since the revolution, a general disenchantment with the mullahs that exists, even though they still are all powerful, transformation could occur. It's conceivable. Second scenario. Uh, he calls it the North Korea scenario. In other words, they play along for a while, they follow the terms of the agreement a year or two. Things are going well, but then they either break out of it or they're caught cheating, and the whole thing breaks down. That's essentially what happened with North Korea in 2002 after an agreement in 1994 to cease their plutonium production. Scenario number three, uh, he calls it strategic patience on Iran's part. What does that mean? He says they play the game. And he says this is, in his view, this is probably the most likely. They play the game with some minor bumps, hiccups along the way. We get through the inspection process. They do what they're supposed to do. They hold their um, enrichment to 3.67% 3. for 15 years. Uh, in years 10 to 15, they have the opportunity to experiment with some more uh, sophisticated centrifuges. They play it out, and at year 15, they become a they move then toward a nuclear, becoming a nuclear power. And the operational implication of all of that is that even if I have the, or he has the uh, order of things wrong, we probably need to prepare in our operational planning and diplomacy for all three of those scenarios. If we want transformation, how are we going to help bring that about? If we want to avoid the North Korean scenario, how do we do that? It, if they actually play it out and become a nuclear power at 15 years from now, what does that mean? We need to think all of those scenarios through. Let me cut you off there. Just hold the I'm thought, done. if you will, so we yeah. can get, uh, sure. I bet people have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And I invite someone who really doesn't like the deal to chime in here, because I think there's been a little bit of optimism um, just from the flow. OK, in the green shirt there. 
I'm Gordon Chang. Um, there has been substantial evidence that the North Koreans have been sharing nuclear weapons technology with the Iranians since perhaps the beginning of this century. And that means that, in, a set, and in effect, Iran could have fissile material in North Korea and probably has plans that the North Koreans have developed for the devices themselves. So the question is, um, how does that affect our ability to inspect this agreement, especially because many people have said that is the critical factor going forward? Who wants to grab the That's Ellen, a Matt question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, the way, the way I think about that would be just to take a step back and look what you need to have a deliverable nuclear weapon, right? And that, that's the biggest threat, but that's, and we're stopping far ahead. You need enough nuclear material, the rich uranium plutonium. You need to actually make a nuclear device that is testable and actually works in an effective delivery mechanism, ICBMs or missiles or otherwise, right? Those are three very difficult things to have. And we are incredibly paranoid to make sure that we're looking at the shortest pole in the tent, you know, to make sure they don't have any of them. But the thing we need to realize is to, Iran needs to get all three. And once we have in this new world, when you have much more contacts with Iran, with a IAEA inspectors, it is much harder for Iran to do those types of things, whether they're working secretly with the North Koreans or anyone else. So even if you get that knowledge, which once it's there, that knowledge exists, and you can't eliminate the knowledge to create nuclear weapons. At most we can do is to try to stop and, and rigorously regulate the behavior and make sure that even if we don't know what Iran's intentions are, we can make sure that we're not gonna trust them and do everything we can to crack down on the behavior. And I think that's the approach that we need to take through this. So as I look at the agreement in the way, same way I approached Iran, it was distrust and verify. You know, in no way did any of our behavior depend on trusting Iran. It was using pressure to get them to the table, looking for opportunities, and along the way do everything we can to keep them honest because we don't really know what the hell they're gonna do. Anybody else want to chime in, or we'll take another question? Well, I mean, I think in the broader, we haven't mm. quite gotten to a kind of broader perspective on nonproliferation, but I can't help but say this will sound yes, a little yes. bit flaky, but I think there is more the United States could do to delegitimize nuclear weapons. And I think that we're going in the other direction again. We are sort of revalidating that nuclear weapons are the, the mark of very advanced countries, um, and that we, you know, I think there's doctrinal debates that happen inside the United States. We're watching Pakistan, India, and China increase their arsenals. And I would say that we miss an opportunity to change the psychology of any aspirant to nuclear weapons. The one other point is that some Iranians, and I, I'm not suggesting that I, I believe everything they say, say that all along we have not been listening, that Iran's goal is to be like Japan which is to stop short of actually assembling or deploying nuclear weapons, but to demonstrate the technological ability so that only in an extremist scenario where they felt that their exist existence as a state was at risk, they would accelerate a program and go to the finish line. We, it took us a long time to trust Japan. We are not ready to give Iran that level. We don't have that level of confidence in Iran. But I think we may be making some very glib assumptions that everybody in Iran wanted to go all the way to a weapon and that there's no internal constraints on them uh, in terms of going that far. So yeah, I, I mean, on, on that, I think, you know, we looked hard as, is we conflate sort of a nuclear Iran, a nuclear power Iran, a nuclear weapon. And I think you're right that, that there is a difference between wanting nuclear power, want to be a threshold nuclear mm -hmm. state, and going through all the cost to actually become a nuclear right. weapon state. And I think for us, this is the opportunity to really test that. And in fact, that's what it's, what it's built around. Mm -hmm. and, and to make sure that we understand it's not a homogenous view within the Iranian population, and it's not a homogenous view, it's either nothing or a nuclear weapon. There are gradations in between. Okay, uh, General Hayden has a question, uh, but I don't know where he is. He's right there he is, is. okay. <laughs> Matt, I agree totally that there are three critical paths to a weapon. I actually try to use that weaponization, delivery systems, fissile material, and tr trying to explain the 2007 NIE. So if ballistic missiles are one of the critical paths, and if going into the negotiations, we actually said quite publicly that they had to be included in any final agreement, and we took them off the table because of Iranian assist insistence, how did they then enter back into the negotiations during the last two weeks in Vienna, and we are now going to lift the sanctions 
on the ballistic missile program in eight years or sooner if the Iranians meet certain conditions? I, yeah, I, I think to be frank, and, and also obviously wasn't in the room in those parts of negotiations that we got there, is the nature of, of the negotiations and what you can get and what you can't. You know, there's a maximalist position the United States wants, and we remain very concerned about the ballistic missile program, of course, regardless of there's agreement or not. I think the way I look at this is that without an agreement, uh, Iran can have an incentive to accelerate the production of ballistic missiles and do much more. The fact that we were able to have some amount of reduction on that, and at the same time, that's just within the terms of the agreement itself. I would say while the agreement itself is going on, the United States potentially has more insights into the program, even though we're not inspecting military sites by just having the sheer amount of discussions in IAEA. And I think the other key part is, as you know, trying to increase the amount of integrated air missile defense, ballistic missile defense technology, and provide and sell more of this technology to the region needs to proceed apace at exactly that same time. So I think we need to see what's possible within the framework of sanctions and the other piece, and what we can actually hold together with international sanctions on that, and effectively see what's possible with a negotiated outcome. But while doing that, make sure that we're doing everything we can on the side, on the defensive side, to advance our own technology and make sure we can monitor and know as much as they're trying to do on that delivery side. Okay, I see Eli Lake, who I think we can count on to inject a note of pessimism. But you may surprise yes. me, Eli. Um, the Supreme Leader of Iran has allegedly issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons. Has anyone in the U.S. government ever seen it? And aren't most fatwas published? And why hasn't this been published? Um, as I understand, they submitted it to the United Nations as a formal document. So the text of it exists. Uh, I just don't know whether anybody knows how to legally and politically uh, accept it as a, as a legitimate document that would have influenced the policy choices of other countries. He's done it, but most people say that you can also issue a fatwa to, to, to the contrary. Um, but I do think that to be, you know, I think there is a discourse in Iran that says nuclear weapons are un-Islamic, uh, and the Iranians intermittently take that fatwa very seriously, and sometimes I think it doesn't quite make the threshold of being an important uh, development. Uh, the fatwa exists. I mean, it, it was submitted as a, f I, under I, I will try to find it for you. My understanding is it was submitted to the United Nations even before these negotiations reached the very active phase as, a, as to explain the position of Iran on the non-proliferation treaty, I believe. Unless either of you has seen the yeah. fatwa, I'm going to take yeah. the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, eager questioner back there. Uh, my mm -hmm. name is Harvey Rushikoff. I'm with the American Bar Association in uh, Cruel and Mori. I want to thank you for, as always, a very thoughtful panel. I have uh, two quick questions. The first is, what impact do you think this deal is going to have on the non-proliferation regime? Because a lot of people are saying that at the end of the 15 years, given if you're correct, John, where Iran stands, that other entities will want to be more threshold-like. And two, given the length of the, um, the plan or the agreement, uh, some of us are recommending that there might be some requirements inside USG to help monitor this over the next 15 years. Maybe the creation of an executive and legislative committee the way we had in the Helsinki Accords, hmm. so that we'd have an ongoing group and an expertise. The Defense Science Board has talked about the lack of that type of expertise we have at USG, and I'm kind of curious how you feel about those two points. Well, I think uh, that would be a good idea. I would, I would personally support the idea of a group like that, particularly a group composed of scientifically knowledgeable people, uh, keeping their eye on the progress of this. On the uh, non-proliferation regime, that's, that's a hard one. Uh, I can see it cutting both ways. One um, positive thing about the NPT with regard to Iran, it's a signatory. Uh, North Korea quit, as you know. Uh, if they accept the additional protocol and they stay in the uh, NPT regime, uh, the, at 15 years, this particular agreement expires but their NPT membership does not, nor do the privileges of the international, of the IAEA to inspect and, and monitor, they don't expire if they stay in the agreement. So part of what we have to do is monitor their adherence to the agreement uh, very carefully. 
Now, um, if they shift to uh, a threshold status at 15 years, yes, others I think will want to do that, although it's a little hard to peer into the future about the worth of nuclear technology 15 years from now. Right now, I mean, I, I would say, why wouldn't Iran want nuclear weapons? I mean, from the standpoint of their national interests. Um, you know, countries look at what happened in parts of the world, Pakistan and so forth, and now North Korea's done three nuclear tests, and by all accounts, are, they are able to assemble 12, 15 nuclear devices. Probably they can put one on a missile, and that has to make us a little more guarded in how we deal with North Korea. People observe that. So this will be a constant struggle, I think, uh, over time, and it'll require more constancy of commitment than we've shown to limiting nuclear weapons. It's been a fad almost. You know, we make a few speeches and we convene some conferences and then uh, we go back to uh, whatever else we're doing. Okay, we have time for a couple more. Right there. Hi, Pamela Brown, Fox News. Um, I received a statement um, from Dr. A.Q. Khan. I'm grateful that you mentioned Pakistan on the panel. And the following statement was given. Um, personally, I feel, this is Dr. Khan, personally I feel that the Iranian leadership has very wisely and pragmatically saved their country from a bad, bad situation. Call it a disaster if you like. I would like to know any personal reaction here from this Look, esteemed say, panel. Say that last part again. Uh, Dr. Khan stated, personally I feel that the Iranian leadership has very wisely and pragmatically saved their country from a very bad situation. Call it a disaster if you like. This is in response for me asking him about uh, the agreement with the P5 plus one. I don't know what others think. I'd have to assume that what he meant was, in the absence of a, an agreement like this, and in the presence of strong US and Israeli commitment to prevent them from having a nuclear weapon, that it was plausible prior to the agreement that a, a military operation might have been carried out. Um, and uh, I mean, you asked me before if I still had the same opinion about that, and I gave you half an answer, but I think one of the, one of the problems with a military operation is that, apart from not knowing where it's going to go, is that you would probably drive the Iranian people together in support of the regime. I don't think you'd create anything else. Um, so I, I think that's probably what he's talking about. That after all, this agreement's a pretty good agreement for them. If, you read, if, you, if anyone here wants to read the 159 pages, I encourage you to do it. It's a good thing for an airplane ride when you need some shut-eye. Uh, the the, the last, last 50 pages are uh, mostly names. But here's, the only point I want to make is we sanctioned the hell out of them. When you look at the last 50 pages is basically lists of things we sanctioned. We sanctioned everything except maybe children's toys, and I'm not even sure of that. So, that got them to the table, but interestingly, it didn't keep them from getting to within two to three months of a nuclear weapon. Think about that. Anybody else want to weigh in, or we'll take another question right there? Hi, Laura Lauder, Lauder Partners. Hasn't the, hasn't the train left the station on this? What would happen if the United States Congress, with a veto-proof majority, rejected the deal? Iran, essentially China, Russia, and India have already begun lifting sanctions for all intents and purposes. So we couldn't put the genie back in the bottle. We couldn't re resurrect the sanctions regime that we already have. So what, would, what, what is Congress thinking about, well, what's next? Because we can't reinstate those sanctions. Look, I, I, I think you raise a really important part, which seem, I think is, is sort of good to conclude with. You know, I, I firmly believe in this agreement and think it makes the United States safer now in the 10, 15 years and generations to come. I also firmly believe we need to have a robust and open debate about what this means. I mean, this is an important part of America's national security that we need to have a debate that recognizes that people on both sides will air their concerns. That said, I think it would be a tremendous mistake for Congress to vote this down uh, and for Congress to pull back the free hand the President has had in this negotiation. So I think we need to go in, and part of the reason why we need to have this debate, I think will become strong if we go for this, is as we've talked about on this panel is, the types of resources the United States needs in the region aren't cheap, and they're not free. And under our types of 
budget problems that we have right now, particularly with the defense budget, I think Congress both needs to debate this issue, understand what is in it, but also commit to understand what it means for America to have a commitment to our own interests, to our allies within the region. And I think only by having that debate do we make us stronger and then, and then coming out forward. Alan, I think we're almost out of time. Do you, want to, do you have a closing thought or do you want to address that? Uh, well, I do think this, this period of lifting of sanctions is going to get a little complicated. It's not going to be a black and white story. I think the Iranians themselves might, there might be political backlash that there hasn't been early relief to the average Iranian citizen. But your point is, is at least partly correct that other countries will abide by the agreement even if we were by a unilateral political choice to say, oops, we changed our minds. We don't really want to abide by this agreement. We still have in place lots and lots of unilaterally imposed uh, sanctions. So Iran is not out of the penalty box by that. And 30 seconds, John, if you want to bring us in for a landing. Uh, well, no, I, 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 I agree with that. I think it would be a bad idea. For, it's a good idea for Congress to debate this because, you know, it, it, I don't know how you evaluate what we've set up here. I think most of us, I mean, I would personally say it's pretty evenly balanced if you add up the advantages and the disadvantages of this agreement. I mean, there are disadvantages to this agreement. Um, Iran gets a lot out of it, but we get something out of it. Uh, what it is, is something we're not very good at d domestically anymore. It's a compromise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much to our panel. Thank you for coming. Great questions. Thanks. That was a perfect ending, John. Yeah, okay. <laughs>